Today I'm here with Mike, referred to me by his friend Adrian. Mike has done over 10 years in the California prison system. But what's particularly interesting about this story is prior to his incarceration, he grew up in a neighborhood where he was getting bullied. And to get protection, he had to join one of the gangs. Those gangs are the Bloods and the Crips. And he's a white guy. So going to prison, the street gang stuff conflicts with the racial gang stuff. Basically, it can be KOS for certain things if you've got certain tattoos and you clicked up with the wrong people if you're a white guy. But I'm going to let Mike explain that more fully right now. Thanks for coming on, Mike. What I just said there right then, was that correct? Um, pretty close. You know, it's, it's the only difference, man, is, is it, I didn't really grow up in that neighborhood. Um, I actually, you know, I'll give you a little bit of my background. Um, I'm from California. I live on the East Coast now. I'd rather not say where specifically. Um, but I, uh, I grew up in a trailer. And um, in that trailer was, um, trailer park is, is kind of poor. And, you know, there's some kids who kind of ran the park. Um, there's a family of five specifically. Um, and I actually didn't join a gang till I moved to the suburbs. Um, but you know, that's a whole story too. I, so I, I started in this trailer park in Santa Cruz, um, somewhere around 10, I moved to San Jose, California, and that's where I claim to be from. That's where I grew up. Um, so moved there about 10. Um, I moved into that neighborhood, man. And, and, and yeah, there was some, some bullies in that neighborhood, a couple Mexican guys, some Norteños. And, um, let me start by saying two men. I, I don't consider myself a tough guy. I think at times I did. Um, but what I learned at a very early age was that physical pain hurt a lot less than being a punk or a bitch or, or having your stuff taken over and over, uh, being bullied, that sort of stuff. You know, later on in prison, um, you know, I, it hurt less, I imagine, than, than, than getting raped, like, like what I'd have to live with with that, you know? So, you know, I moved to San Jose. Um, we got this house. We got a deal from family. So, like, I always felt like I didn't belong in that suburban neighborhood. You know, we were dirt poor. Um, I come from uh, a lot of, not my parents, but my mom's family, drugs and alcohol. My grandma was a famous Vegas showgirl. Um, she would steal my mom's welfare checks. You know, my mom was 17 with two kids and, um, which, you know, to me now is, is a pretty normal story. I, I deal with a lot of drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, you know, I mentor some guys and stuff like that. Um, but so anyways, forgive me if I'm all over the place. So I moved to San Jose, you know, there's some bullies in the neighborhood, man. And, and, um, I was always trying to figure out how to keep my shit right when these guys came around how to not deal with them and how to get them back. So moving forward, man, I, I end up um, a lot of violence in my, in my life, man. I all through middle school. I, I always got caught with weapons at school. Um, I always had a knife until I got stabbed and then I became afraid of knives. Um, but I always had something. And uh, so I got kicked out of one, one um, school district. They moved me to another school district. I used my aunt's address. Um, went to Del Mar, Campbell Middle School, Del Mar. I had always been fascinated by the gangsters. They always, people feared them. They appeared to have power. They appeared to be making money. You know, I was always fascinated by that. I'm a, I'm, I'm a fairly intelligent dude. I, I only got as far as I did in school because I remembered everything. I didn't do any homework. I'd rather drink, get high and, and mess with girls. Um, but I, I did, I, I absorbed everything. I, I, I saw everything. I absorbed things. I was good at breaking things down. Good at uh, figuring out how to get what I want. So I end up, um, again, get, I want to get to that. I end up at this school called uh, Gunderson, man. And it was a black school. So I'm getting kicked out of this school, that school, this school, that school. And, you know, again, I, I'm a person who was never, very comfortable with myself you know all the social stuff seemed to be more powerful to me um you know that that getting embarrassed um like i'm the kid who on the soccer field the kid
takes the ball from you and scores a goal, you know, some kids get mad or angry. I'm the kid who wants to fucking murder him. I want that kid fucking dead, right? And 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 that was just always me, man. It, 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 the social stuff had such a massive impact on me. So I was obsessed with fitting in. And and what happens later, um, you know, is is I learned how to wear masks. You know, because you talked about I'm I'm a gangster crip on the streets. In fact, you know, I, I still am. I, I I never got out. On and we we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. Uh, how do you live a spiritual life, you know? Because um, that's how, what I how try does, to do. How does a white guy join that gang? <clears throat> right. So I end up at the school, Gunderson, man. I'm the only white kid at the school. Probably not the only one. But I'm hanging out with these guys. And, and again, from the very early age, I was, I was always into the streets, man. And, and um, you know, it's funny. I had a couple mentors. They were actually bloods, man. Two of the guys, this guy, Oriol and Marset. Um, who really took me under the wing and kind of showed me the streets. They showed me where to find guns. They showed me how to sell drugs, stuff like that. They were always in my like peripheral. They weren't inner circle dudes, but, but they liked me and, and they ran the streets down to me, man. Uh, you know, it's funny because when I get into the gang life, um, I never had beef with, with bloods, man. All my beef was always Crips and Norteños. You know, that, that was my beef always. Um, and, and in fact, the biggest war I was involved in was with other Crips. But in my town, we didn't have a ton of bloods. They were in the surrounding town, San Francisco uh, and the whatnot. So um, I ended up at this school all black, man. And, and so what I do is I fit in, right? I'm, I'm blue dickied out with, with Nike Cortezes. I got the lines shaved in my eyebrow. You know, I want to fit in. Um, and I got to be tough, man. And, and again, so I knew these OG bloods who... I could be guy who I, I didn't use drugs till I was 17, but I drank, I drank, I drank, I drank from 11, but I could sell drugs, right? I could get things. I could find guns and I wasn't scared to fight, man. And I knew how to carry myself. So I, I earned a lot of respect in that school. Uh, and, 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 you know, I also hung out in the right places. A lot of it was, I ended up being in the right place at the right time. There was this crew called Dark Side Mob, and they were some Crips, some older Crips. I also ran into this dude, Ronnie, who, who he was the one who got me affiliated, got me to get to know this guy and, and some guys from the LA Deuce Crips. I got jumped into, originally what I got jumped into was uh, called Fresh Deuce Crips. It was a, a smaller crew of, of these LA Crips, because it all comes from LA. You know, the, the original Crips. And in fact, living on the East Coast, man, I... Explain to people, what, ju so, explain to people what jumped in means, because some people might right, not so know. So a lot of crews... Yeah, so a lot of crews do it differently, man. But basically, I had to take an ass whooping from everybody in the crew for about three minutes. Um, but before that, I had to earn my way. I had to do dirt. And I'm telling you, because I'm white, I had to do more than everybody else. And basically what that was, was when we go to war, somebody needs to be hit, I'm the dude doing it. Um... You know, I, I don't claim to have ever killed anybody. I, I've hurt a lot of people very badly. Um, I never shot anybody, man. I had a pistol. I never shot anybody. Uh, I never pulled it out uh, on anybody because I, I, I always knew I'm not pulling it out unless I'm ready to use it. You know, again, I had gained this fear of knives at some point when I got stabbed. Um, and I had seen dude had, had dudes have weapons taken from them and used on them. Um, and again, it, it was more, it was at home, you know, it was the the home um but i i always had it if i needed it um and but again you know i'm 44 and, and in the 90s man and even the 80s we fought you know we chucked them we didn't use a lot of guns man the, the drive-by started then but again that was more of an la thing um and i ran into a lot of shit too because black dudes don't like in the gang life they don't like to get beat up by a white guy they, they don't like it man so fast forward, I'm at this school. It's all crip, man. I go back to jail. I, I spent that 11 years that I spent in jail was over about a 13 year period. So I'd go in for a couple years. I'd get out. I'd go in for a couple years. I was never out for more than four months in that, in that 15 to 28 years old. 15, I was arrested for robbing houses. Uh, and then it started to grand theft auto and, and then all the assaults and stuff like that. I'm a two striker in California, um, which another felony in California. It's life. Um, so I, I end up here, here's where it all happened, man. And I'm going to drop a name in here and people aren't going to like it, man. But, you know, I've emailed ESPN numerous times and they don't fucking pick it up. Um, I, I just don't like bullshit. So I, I go to jail from Gunderson, man. I brought a weapon to school and I was on probation for the burglaries. I turns out I robbed the cop's house and, um, 
Yeah. Dude, it's amazing. I, I, I was at like a, I was at a school for the kids who get kicked out of the school that the kids go to, they got kicked out of school, right? Like a last chance type of school. And my mom found all this shit in my, in my, um, I had, you know, um, cufflinks and wedding bands and all this shit. I was robbing houses, dude, stuff that a 15 year old kid had no business having. And, um, so my mom made me bring it all to my school and my counselors, man. And they gave me two choices. You go back and you return this stuff to the owners or we call the cops. So I did, I went and I brought it to the owners, man. And the owner of the last house, there's four houses that I, I was able to return some stuff to. The last house, like the guy looks at me and he's like, you know, this is really admirable of you, which, you know, it's not admirable. I don't really have a choice. Um, he, but he pulls out a badge. And so anyways, I end up, you know, with charges. Um, moving forward, I, 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 I'm on probation for that. I go back to jail for bringing a weapon to school again. It was a knife at the time. I was stabbed like, it was like 23 or something. That's when I stopped dealing with knives. But um, so when I get out of jail, San Jose, Santa Clara, uh, Un San Jose Unified School District, it was, they started this new program where all the kids who were going to jail were coming out of the same schools. It was my school, Gunderson and Andrew Hill, right? And it was the all black schools. Um, I don't blame them. I, I'm not going to get caught up in the you know, why do black people go to jail? I'm not going to do all that, you know, but, but it was those two schools where all the gangs were. And uh, so I was the first guy, they sent me to the rich part of town to Almaden high school. And uh, I roll up to Almaden high school, man. I'm, I'm a junior and I wear blue Dickies and Nike Cortezes, man. And these guys are all jocks and rich and, and, you know, shirts like this and uh, Mercedes and, and BMWs in the parking lot. And, um, you know, by this time, man, I, I'm pretty good at wearing masks and fitting in, um, but I'm also locked into my lifestyle. You know, I was never a big shot. Um, you know, I, I did end up being a president of, of this small crew that I was up. They set me up recruiting, um, but it wasn't a big shot thing, man. I, you know, again, I, I just was never a big shot. I, I was always trying to be a big shot, um, but I was respected. I was known in some circles and I knew the right dudes to get in tight with. I, I happened to be in the right place a couple of times with these guys from dark side mob and I had their back and um, it's amazing what not running will do for you. You know, just not running away when the shit hits the fan um, and, and being willing to fight with these dudes. And so I go to Almaden high school, man. And, and uh, there's a gentleman there and you may know the name, um, Pat Tillman. He was an NFL player who used to play with the Arizona Cardinals. He, he walked away from a $5 million contract to go fight in the war. Um, you know, admirable. I think, uh, I think the men in his family had been in every great war in America. And, uh, you know, I respected that, man. I appreciated it. He died a friendly fire. And, and every year I hear him make, made into a hero. Um, but what I never hear is how him and his brother Kevin were fucking bullies, man. They were real fucking bullies. The whole fucking football team at Leland High School were a bunch of fucking assholes who thought they ran that school. And I rolled into school, man, and I don't look like everybody. And I'm not going to be pushed around. I'm not going to be told where I can sit, where I can't sit. And and I end up fighting these dudes. And if you've ever seen a picture of Pat Tillman, man, you know, at 25, at my at my biggest, you know, I was I was 165 pounds. I'm a little bit bigger now, but it's all belly. Um, so I would fight these guys, man. And I got tired of getting my ass fucking kicked. You know, one day I got fucking cracked in the head with a football helmet and I would get jumped by these dudes. So I went back to these crips, man. And I was like, what do I got to do to get in? Right. I told them where I was at. I think they liked the situation. I'm in the rich part of town now. And if I can go out there and recruit and start selling their drugs, it's a gold mine for them. So uh, they jumped me into this crew. Um, I, I mean, it wasn't just that simple. I'd already done stuff. I had to go be on the front line, um, but they respected me. Um, I didn't get jumped into directly their crew. I got, it's like a lineage thing. I got jumped into like the lineage of these dude scripts from LA and they set me up recruiting. They told me to go find all the Asians and the black guys at the school and everybody else who felt like they were getting bullied. And at that time in the early nineties and, and at least in California and San Jose, um, there was a big, there was a lot of Crip gangs. The Asian boys were coming up, uh, AKA was another Asian gang. Um, Sons of Samoa, SOS, they were Crips. They were really big. They're still probably pretty big, but, but like that was when, uh, 
you know, again, other, other races were really starting to come into the gang life. And, um, and, and, you know, I wasn't the only white crip, man. I mean, I met a number of them. There, there's, there's some really cool stories on YouTube. You know, Goldie was a beast, man. I don't know if you know who he is from that. I think he was the eight tray or something. Anyways. Um, so yeah, so they set me up, man. And I start recruiting. I start recruiting these dudes. Uh, I start moving drugs to a school. Um, somewhere around 17, I started using drugs. And so I wasn't making much money, but they were, right? I don't care who's using it. Um, I wasn't that bad with the drugs at the time, and I, I drank a lot. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the deal, man. And, and then I graduate high school, and uh, now I'm, I'm still around the school because now I got to watch the money. And so that was all interesting. I, you know, that town didn't like me very much. They started holding teen violence meetings or something. And basically the whole thing was telling everybody to stay away from the Deanna boys, which is me and my brother. I had a little brother. He was bigger than me and, and he never liked being in my shadow. So he was, he was actually the crazy one. Um, he always felt like he had to outdo me and it, he loves me. We're best friends, but, but he didn't want to be in my shadow. Uh, so that's kind of that, man. And, and, you know, so then I roll forward, right? I get out of high school, man. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm rolling, I'm doing my thing, man. And, and, uh, I, I always kind of had a job, like I'd wait tables, man, but I was always stealing. And, um, we ended up in a war. My gang ended up in a war with this, this crew called 408 mob. They were other crips, man. And, and we lost the war. It all started with, um, jeez. Yeah, so we were at the mall, uh, you know, that's kind of where we hung out sometimes, but we were at the mall one day and some little dude, we called him bitch boy. He was at the mall and he was like yelling our gang out and shit like that. And, and somebody didn't like it. And he said, fuck you pussies and ran off. Uh, but he had said our gang name. And, uh, you know, a couple of days later, a couple of my boys, along with, the, they weren't, a couple of my boys were there at the mall or somewhere with a couple other guys. It was the mall. Um, and again, I wasn't there for this, but the best that I understand it is these dudes recognize one of my guys, man. They jumped these dudes. I get a call. We show up, we show up about 15 of us. Um, we head down to Lake man and, and, uh, we catch up with these dudes and we're fighting them. And we had a couple of white boys. We were kind of mixed. Like again, the crew that I was set up recruiting, we're mixed Asian, black, white. Um, so we end up fighting these dudes and we end up fucking these dudes up. We fucked them up good. Um, and they don't like that. They didn't like that at all, man. Um, I had been in jail with one of their dudes, 408 Mob, this dude, Frank Raymore, man. I was in, in a juvenile hall with him, and we were pretty tight. So I called him up, and I said, listen, Doobie, man, uh, you know, this shit happened. It was all in some bullshit, man. It all started on something that somebody said. It wasn't even our crew. You know, your boys jumped our guys, and we can't let that ride. So we came back. You know, you've won some. We've won some. Let's let it go. I invited him to a party that I was having at my house and uh, they showed up, uh, they showed up kind of loud and obnoxious. And uh, I was like, dude, you guys can't do that. You know, like, like chill out. We're just here to have fun. You can't be yelling and screaming. I mean, it, it, it was pretty clear they wanted problems, right? Like they were just doing that to be defiant or whatever. They keep being crazy. So I listen, man, you guys got to knock this shit off or you got to go or what was their answer. And I was like, dude, I'm going to fight your biggest fucking dude. I'll fight your biggest fucking dude. Win or lose, you guys just leave, right? You guys just leave. And again, like, there's that part of me that knows when I do that, I'm probably going to get my ass whooped, but the respect that comes with it, right? And I always knew that. I always knew that. Dude, when I got, when I'm sitting in county jail and I get, the judge says to me, five years, Right. Um, the first thought in my head is no, 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 right, right, like no. The judge just give me five years. I'm like, no, I'm not doing five years. What are you talking about? And then it sets in that you don't have a choice, right? So then my next thought is stripes. This is stripes, bro. And I didn't snitch, you know. I didn't snitch, and and ultimately, man, that's the reason I really ended up being respected later on. And that is the reason that today I can call myself an OG gangster crip, you know. So and did, and did I don't you, get out. I can't. Did you fight the guy at the house party or did something else happen? Right. So here's what happened, man. This big fucking dude, Larry Arnold Book, man, from 408 Mob. And I, and I didn't really want to do this, give shout outs and fuck yous, but fuck Larry Arnold Book from 408 Mob. Um, I, listen, I, I go to San Jose every year now, man. And there's this one shopping corner 
right? Where there's a, there's a place I like to shop for clothes and I go there and then on, on one of the four corners, right on a corner, on this corner is a sandwich shop that I used to manage. Togo's fucking love their sandwiches, man. Great pastrami sandwich. Um, and then on this corner is when I go see my friends, uh, cause I have my good friends now are the ones that were in my peripheral. Now, when I go home, I check in, but I don't go hang out with the dudes no more. And I don't have to, I did my dirt. I did my time. I didn't snitch. Right. So again, if they called on me, I got to show up. When I go to New York, when I moved to New York, I'm not in New York now. I had to check in. I had to let the local Crips know I'm here, you know? Um, which is a good thing too, because if I get in trouble and, and all of a sudden I need some help, like let's just say I'm wearing blue and I, I'm there and so, I, some bloods come at me, I can't call in the Crips to help me if I haven't checked in and let them know I'm in town, right? So anyways, um, so there's these three corners, right? I, I get my sandwiches here. I go see my boys. I go, I, I, I buy liquor at this liquor store. They got, you know, some nice stuff and, and I bring that to my friends. And there's this fourth corner. It's so funny. I can't go on that corner because that's 408 mob territory. I was almost killed at that liquor store. And we can get into that later, man. I was, I was in a coma and, um, but, but I can't go on that corner, you know? And, and, um, so anyways, we, I, I, I fight this dude, man. He's a big fucking guy, man. We had been in that fight the day before and I got cracked right here with the stick. So my right arm is, is hurting, bro. And, and I don't know if it's fractured or what. I don't go to a hospital, um, but it hurts, dude. So I go on, I fight this dude. I hit him in the mouth. I'm like, oh shit, that hurts. So I can't really hit him with my right. It's not an excuse. He's a big dude. He's going to whoop me anyways, probably. But I'm fighting him, man. And I keep getting up and I keep getting up and I keep getting up. And this dude's like, you know, like I thought he would respect me. Right. I keep coming. I keep coming. I keep coming. I keep coming. This dude wins. Finally, some other dudes from his crew are like, all right, enough. Like, you know what I mean? Enough. And uh, so they end up leaving. And then about an hour later, they come and shoot up my house. Mm. Right. An hour later, they come and shoot up my fucking house. They didn't hit anybody. We're all inside um, my mom's house. I'm like, damn, I could have got away with the party, bro. But um, I, they, they actually did hit a pregnant woman in the leg, but nobody was seriously hurt. Um, she probably shouldn't have been at the party anyways. But so this started a war, you know, and uh, we were able, we were clicked up with a lot of crews, man. You know, Insane Crip Gang, Dark Side Mob, a number of crews. Um, and ultimately what ended up happening, man, is we were out manned, out gunned. Um, we, we lost this war, bro. They, they, they fucking smashed us. Again, I, I never lost any homies to any bloods, man. The only fucking homies I lost were the Crips and Nordanios. And, uh, you know, I, we ended up dissolving our gang. Um, there was another factor to it, and that was that. So when I had went to that high school, junior year and then senior year, um, I had a brother, and I brought him with me the next year in my senior year, and he was a sophomore. And I knew as a senior that, it, and, and, and with the way my mind works and I can convince people, uh, I recruited sophomores and juniors, younger people, right? I can control them to a degree with my mind. Um, and I showed power, dude. Listen, at Leland High School, when I joined the Crips, 50 fucking Crips showed up at school after school. You know, that was over. I took over that school. I owned that fucking school. We ran the seniors out of the senior tree. There was no, I mean, there was no more, uh, what's his name? The Tillmans run this school. I, I ran that school. And um, so anyways, Moving forward, um, you know, we, we get into this whole gang fight, man, and, and uh, we lose that fight. Somebody at the school had had a phone list from our crew in their backpack and got caught with it. So my whole crew now, the police knew who we were. And between that, the cops harassing us, um, the school harassing, you know, the younger members and the people who were selling drugs for us. Um, it was time to end it. Uh, so then anyways, fast forward a little while, man, I end up in prison, right? And I don't know if you want to just jump to that. Listen, I got great stories. I can tell you the did, story about. Did you almost get beat to death before prison or after? Yeah. Prison? Oh, once in prison, once before. Let's, so let's one day do we're the, at the, do lake, the first man. one. Do the before prison one first. Yeah. So I'm at the lake. I mean, I'm in the lake right one time, man. And we love this lake. They had this sign up. It was the funniest shit I've ever seen. The sign says, absolutely no alcoholic beverages allowed. Except. Beer, wine, sake, malt liquor, champagne. Like, it named every non-hard. I mean, it was so detailed. It was fucking hilarious. So we used to go there and drink. We could bring beer and whatever. 
And, uh, you know, we always had liquor too, but we'd try to hide that. So you could drink at this lake, man. We throw these massive barbecues and we had all these other crews came in. It was like a big old fucking like SOS showed up. Everybody. I mean, all these different fucking crews showed up. Excuse me. And, um, so we're there one day and we decided we wanted to go get some more liquor and we're going to go get some weed. Forgive me. So me and my buddy, we go to, um, what is it called? Southgate Liquors, man. Uh, it, it's on that corner where I'm not allowed, bro. And it happens to be 408 mob territory. Uh, so I show up there and uh, I run into the liquor store. I come out, my buddy's arguing with this dude. And there's three dudes. And uh, the dude fucking cracks him. The biggest dude just fucking knocks my boy. He hits my, my boy, drops instantly. They stop putting boots on him. So I jump in. Um, the one guy, what I didn't know was one guy ran to the car and got a pipe. So I'm fighting these dudes. I'm really just, I'm trying to save my boy from dying. I mean, they're stomping him out. And I, I got no chance of winning this, right? But uh, so what ends up happening, man, and, and it's crazy shit later. I see this reenactment of what happened to me on TV. Nothing like experiencing watching a reenactment. And that's a whole story too, man. I'm sitting in, in county jail out to court. Um, I'll get into that, man, because that's a cool story, too. Um, so this guy comes up, and he hits me in the back of the head with my pipe. I have a permanent uh, dent in my skull, uh, which I didn't tell people about for years, because if I get hit there, man, I could, I could die. I mean, it's a permanent dent. Um, so I get cracked over the head, dude. I, I um, wake up like three days later at the hospital with all these tubes in me and shit. My only experience with morphine and, and that shit was great. I hear you talk about ecstasy, man. And <laughs> you describe it really well. I was, I was more mushrooms and, and Southern comfort guy. Um, and anyways, um, so what ends up happening is I wake up a few days later in the hospital. And by this time, man, I'm, I'm pretty alcoholic. Uh, I'm pretty deep into al alcohol and drugs, man. I'm, I'm not breathing a lot of sober breaths, but, but I'm not like a sloppy mess yet. You know, listen, the, the boys would not have put up with that. They don't put up with that, right? Um, but anyway, so I, I wake up and they tell me the, if I hadn't been as drunk as I was, I'd probably be dead. And boy, I thought that was the coolest shit ever, right? I, I, I carried that flag for you. I worshiped alcohol and marijuana. I worshiped that stuff, right? Everything was about, I mean, again, you remember the 90s, man, when it was all about the bongs and and, uh, you know, all the cool weed shirts and, and uh, you just, you glorified all that shit and uh, worshiped it. And so anyways, I thought that was the coolest shit in, ever, dude. So I end up, I'm in the hospital, right? A couple of days later, they let me out. And uh, I'd been in a coma for a couple of days, for three days. And what ends up happening is they let me out and they tell me to come check back in in three days. I come back, check in in three days because I got this yellow shit coming out of my ear. Like the blood part is gone. But yellow shit's coming out. And uh, there's a cool story in here. I don't know if Adrian knew this one to tell you, to ask me about. Uh, I mean, listen, my, my mom doesn't think it's cool. She doesn't think it's funny at all. And, and probably normal people don't think it's cool or funny. Um, but I'm dark and weird. So I come back in three days, right, to check in with the hospital. And the doctor says, what the fuck? You got spinal fluid coming out of your ear. How did they discharge you, right? And I'm like, what's the big deal? I feel fine. He's like, dude, like you have spinal fluid coming out of your ear. Death is not necessarily the worst thing that happens here. Right. He's like, have you ever heard of meningitis? I'm like, nah, is that with your teeth? <laughs> you know? Um, so he admits me immediately. And I have been in the hospital, man, for like two months. I have my birthday in there and uh, people are bringing me alcohol. I'm dying to get outside to smoke or whatever. And, um, you know, your halfway friends, dude, after a while, they stop showing up. And uh, so one day, man, I, nobody was there and I, I needed to drink. I, I had, So here's what happened. I, I had to backtrack a little. They ended up having, I needed the membrane. Your, there's a membrane that is around your brain, right? That covers your brain, that keeps everything in your brain in and everything that doesn't belong in your brain out. That membrane had been ruptured, right? So there was spinal fluid is created in the base of your spine. There's pressure there. It pushes it down, right? Well, if it's got another place to go, it's going to go there, right? The doctor's concern is if spinal fluid can get out of my brain, something can get in, 
right? And if you get something inside your spine, inside your brain, again, death is not necessarily the worst thing that happens. So like we, you know, that was crazy, dude. Staying in the hospital and, and like 6 a.m. every morning, I used to be like, you guys are fucking vampires. They show up to take blood. And, um, you know, it's just, they don't even wake you up anymore, right? They're just taking your blood. And um, what needed to happen was, spinal fluid had to stop coming out of my ear for for three days for 72 hours for that membrane to heal it wasn't happening so they put a spinal tap in me right and most people know what that is is that's a needle in your spine and uh you can't really move you can't whatever dude so at this point nobody's really showing up and bringing me what i need and one day i need to drink and uh you know i'm going through dts and, and i'm not telling the doctors what's going on and i get up out of my bed to go to the fucking to the liquor store uh, oh. and again, with with a rack of spinal fluid and a needle in my spine man and security's like dude where are you going and i said if you touch me i'll own this fucking hospital right if you touch me if we have a scuffle i'm gonna own this hospital and again like just the arrogance and and who i think i am is really gross to me now when I look back on it. But I, dude, I show up at the liquor store and I'm a dude who looks pretty young, man. There's no way I looked of age at like, in, that was 2000, so 25. And the guy didn't ask me any questions, man. I walked in, I got liquor and I walked out. Um, and yeah, I had money. I had my wallet on me. You know, I, I got some of my stuff. I've been at the hospital for, you know, a couple months. And uh, yeah, my mom doesn't know that one, man. I, that, that it's, I, again, I, I thought this shit was funny for years, man. Um, but that's how I operate, man. When, when I need what I need or I want what I want, I go get it. And, and you better stay out of my way, you know? And unfortunately, even if you're family, just stay out of my way. So fast forward a little while, man. I end up in prison. Um, I, I crushed this dude's uh, face with a rock. I almost killed him, man. It, it I shattered his... Uh, like a softball sized rock, dude. I, I shattered his both. Um, what are these? The orbitals were broken. His jaw was completely shattered. Um, yeah. And uh, it's something I still feel bad about, man. And, and it's something I, I'd love to see the guy and try to make it right to him if I could. But was it a gang rivalry thing? Or? That was not, man. That was a guy talking shit. He was running his mouth, man. And uh, I was drunk. And I, I didn't need to pick up a rock, man. But I. I picked up what was around and I fucking crushed him. That was not a gang related thing. Um, but I end up in prison behind that. Um, later on came some gang shit. It, it was a sales thing and I, I didn't tell. So anyways, you know, I do want to get to, so now I roll into prison. I get into, um, I get into County jail, man. I get this prison sentence and, uh, I'm talking to all the OGs and, uh, you know, everybody, it doesn't matter, county jail, white, black, Mexican, whatever, what to expect in prison. And uh, the white guys are telling me, man, you, you better shake this crib shit, you know? And I'm, again, I'm left with a real dilemma, man, a serious dilemma, what I'm going to do. And uh, so I roll up into prison, Mr. Peckerwood soldier. And uh, did I, I really, I'm a lucky dude, man. One of my best friends, he was a crip. He rolled into the pen I was in and uh, he kept his mouth shut. He kept his fucking mouth shut, man. And I, I mean, I don't know, you know, where anybody else has done time or, or what, but number one target in the California state prison is a white crip. They're just picked off. And number two, the child molesters are first. Did you um, have tattoos, gang tattoos? No, no. I didn't. I have no. That's not true. I have my crew right here, and and uh, I did get called on that later. Uh, so so I roll into prison, man. Let me just tell you a little bit about that, dude. I'm I'm 23. I'm 165 pounds, but I'm smart and I've absorbed everything that the OGs have said to me, right? And I already have this like, I don't want to say fearless, man, um, but like, so I was never really afraid of dying. You know, and I'm still kind of not, and except now it's that my my kids need a dad, and I'm a stay-at-home dad, which is crazy. You know, people who know me growing up that I'm I'm responsible for raising three young children is is crazy. But I I don't know what it was, man. That that like physical harm and death um, 
were not something I, I was really terrible. I, I lost most of my fights, man. My nose has been broken four times. I, and I told you about that fight. I had my eardrum blown out another time. I got dipped so hard. This guy bounced me off the sidewalk and broke my shoulder. Um, I've been stabbed. I've been shot at. I've had pistols in my face and, and punked the dude with the pistol, you know? Um, and again, it's, it's, it's just for me, the other pain, man, of being a bitch, being a pussy, getting picked on over and over and over again was much stronger, you know? And, and I learned already, dude, even if I take an ass whoop and I get respect for that, you know? Um, so I, I had my crew on me and later on, dude, I was doing a year violation in a, a prison called Pleasant Valley. And uh, these dudes roll up on me from my town and, and I got respect again in prison. Um, at least in California state prison, what you've done follows you. And it's a crazy small world, dude. Like it's amazing. That's 20 years ago. I could probably walk into the prison now and, and not necessarily my name, but the ink I have tells a story of what I've done. You know, I, I earned my shit. Um, and it's funny, dude, I'm like frontline beating up a white grip in prison, right? Talking about Peckerwood soldier. And, 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 and I mean, dude, I'm in there prospecting with the fucking skinheads, right? There's nothing racist about me, but that seems like they have power, right? That seems like if I get in with the dudes and in retrospect, the skinheads have no power. They're a bunch of fucking, they're a bunch of punks and pieces of shit. I shouldn't say punks, man. That's a powerful word. They're not punks. That's certainly not what they are. I see. I, I say stuff, man. I'm a little far removed, and and I've gotten soft in my ears, man. Uh, but I don't live watching my every word and shit anymore, you know. Um, so but, so they didn't sweat you at all when you went in. No, no. And until uh, this year violation, man. These guys rolled up on me. Two white guys from my county, and in in state prison in, in California, it's all racial, right? <clears throat> you're you're bunked up, you're sold up, and you know I I tell you a little bit about that too. When I got to prison, when I first rolled in, they put me in a dorm. Um, like, fuck, two hundred people in a in a in a gym, not a dorm, a gym. Three high bunks. It's crazy. It's chaos, and it's a little scary. Um, again, I don't. At this time, I had been stabbed, right, and it was totally unexpected. I was in a fight. This dude came to swing at me like this, and I'm like. I'll catch that. And, you know, except when he hit me at, Oh, Whoa. And why am I bleeding? So I had a real fear of knives, man. That, that went, that was a uh, less than an inch from my lung. Um, almost killed me. So, um, you know, I always had a weapon in there. I, I carried a padlock and a sock, you know, you can do some real damage with a padlock and a sock. Um, and deniability too. I, I dropped the sock when the cops are coming and all I have, is, I don't know. I have my padlock in my pocket. Um, I got to this, this gym living and I couldn't take it, man. I was a level two security risk. I was in there for violence, um, and my age. So that was a little bit of security risk. Um, but I was a first timer, right? They didn't have a file on me of doing stuff or whatever. So they overrode me to a level one yard, which was miserable. And, um, I did my thing. I, I, I figured out quickly, I'm getting the fuck out of level one. I need to go, I need to get to a level three yard. I need to get to cell living. And uh, I was about a year into it where I was like, yeah, I, I need to find a cell living. I need a guy who's doing about seven years. He's already got a TV. He's already got a radio, right? He's not a long-term, like, <laughs> In California State Prison, the most chill dudes in there are the lifers. In my experience, it's their home. They want to see you go home, you know, and they don't want a bunch of drama in their house. Like, again, the strong ones, they've accepted. This is where I live. I'm not going anywhere. And, um, but it's the dudes with like 12 to like 23 years that are fucking off the chain, dude. A lot of them came in on a three year bid, right? Now they're doing 23. They're not quite at life, right? But they're probably going to do life. I mean, they're probably never getting out of prison and probably looking at a lot of years in ad seg. You know, those just crazy off the chains dudes, man, that are stabbing motherfuckers and, and, and getting in dirt. And, you know, for me, dude, I, I figured out quickly, beat up the child molesters who roll in from your town. A, they're usually pretty easy to beat up. B, everybody fucking loves you, even the cops. I mean, that was my experience. I earned all my stripes doing that, man. I, have, I got 72 hours worth of fucking tattoos on me. 
lames don't get that in prison, right? Lames don't. I, you know, I figured out how to do that too. I, I bought my own tattoo gun. I let the tattoo artist use it. I cleaned it and I got my tattoos for half price. Um, but you still have to do certain things to earn your tattoos. And, but again, I, I figured out when a child molester rolls in from my town, go fuck that dude up. And uh, that's how I earned my stripes. But I came in, I, I, I'm all over the place. I came in, uh, gym living, um, got into a couple fights, went to dorm living, which was 31 men in a dorm. And I, I watched the Northern Mexicans and the Southern Mexicans, the Serenos and the Norteños. Um, I watched them have a full blown fucking war, man. Where like they got their lock. It's, it's like they got two castles built with lockers, man, and mattresses. And they got spears made out of mop handles. They got uh, phone books and shit tied on them for for armor. They're throwing buckets of 190 degree water on each other, and and you're all just like trying to stay out of the way, right? And crazy shit. And I'm like, I gotta get out of this, man. I need. So again, I I, I got in some more fights. I ended up. Um, <laughs> I got my ass beat. Dude almost killed me. Uh, one of my favorite rappers, man, I fought in prison. Uh, I never told him I was a fan. I just, you know, do that in prison. Hey, buddy, I'm your fan, you know? Um, but yeah, I, and I, this dude fucked me up, man. I, I hit him once. I hit him in the jaw. I, I think I caught him off guard. He was being disrespecting me, and I just cracked him. He hit me back. Um, he just hit me in the right spot, and I was out. I was out the minute he hit me, and before I landed, he had me by the shirt, and he picked me up and bounced me. Um, my, my cousin was in prison with me that time. He told me the whole story. Um, Can you say who that guy's name is? With, yeah, Selly Cell from Vallejo, California. Yeah, man, he's one of my favorites. He's a stud. Um, are you tapping, so, are you tapping wait, your hands? No, no, Legos, man. I got Legos everywhere. Oh, yeah, it's making a real bad noise over what you're saying. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, which reminds me, I, you know, I, um, what was the, the one I was going to tell you about? Uh, Oh, so while I'm in prison, dude, check this out, man. And, and uh, you know, people can judge me what they want. Uh, I'm sitting in prison, man, and I get called out to county jail. Uh, they want me to testify against the dudes that almost killed me when I was in a coma. Um, and, uh, you know, I bring, uh, I, I bring like, fuck, 30 cigarettes. And, you know, I, I pack my butthole. In county jail, a cigarette goes for like 10 bucks, bro. And, and a cigarette is like a quarter of what a real cigarette is. And uh, so I, you know, I, I pack a pouch of bugler and, and a lighter and some papers and I go back to county and that's a whole nother thing, dude. I roll up there and the Mexicans run it, the Norteños. San Jose is the heart of Norteño country. And um, so I roll back there and I, I know a dude, man. And basically, if you roll into county jail with something like that, they're taking half. And there's just nothing you can do about it. You can fight it all you want. I fortunately knew a dude, he was an OG. And uh, he let me keep 60%. I just, I walked right in. I was like, this is what I got. Um, you know, what are we doing here? And he let me keep 60%, which was 10% more than you normally get to keep. And you can fight it if you want, bro. You just, it's not happening. Um, so I go out to court, man, and I'm sitting there one day. They had caught one of the dudes. I'm sitting there one day watching the TV, man. And on the news, I'm watching this thing. I, like, it went slow-mo for me. I'm like, oh, that's... Uh, Stonegate liquors, right? I almost got killed there, right? I think it's all funny. And I start to watch this shit unfold. It was a reenactment of what happened to me. And I'm like, <laughs> it was so surreal. I mean, they had footage. There was cameras around, but you couldn't see anything up close. But they actually had actors do a reenactment. It, it was the weirdest crap I've ever had. And I tell you, man, I, all honesty, um, I went in there that time and, and people could judge me if they want. I, I snitched on that dude. And here's the why it, it didn't get me off any, it got my brother off five years. They had gotten my brother. He was getting ready to do five for assaulting a peace officer. And, and I mean, five was going to be lucky for him. My brother's done probably close to 17, 18 years in prison. Um, turns out he's paranoid schizophrenic too. And, and, and that's just a whole nother level of, um, what you're capable of um but i roll in there and they're like hey we got this guy he's we believe he's the one who you know was involved in i got no negative feeling on that dude right I, I still hate larry arnold and some of those dudes but i didn't have no beef with that guy um but i walk in there they're like we just picked your brother up your brother's gonna do five years and and i have no doubt about that right with my brother's record um if he sneezed on a on a cop's shoe he's probably getting five years 
you know, and my brother fights cops all the time. So I went in there. I don't even know if it was the dude. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's him. And, uh, you know, people can judge me if you want. Um, I, I didn't do it to benefit myself, but but absolutely for my brother. Uh, but there was some other burglaries and some other drug sales and shit like that that I didn't snitch on the homies for. I did time for that. And I got respect. But it's amazing how I was able to juggle these two lives, man. I'm sitting in prison and these two white boys from my town roll up on me. On a, I'm there on a year violation, Pleasant Valley Prison. And uh, the one dude, he rolls up. He's like, dude, we know what that tattoo on your neck is. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, that ever so crazy. We know what that is. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, right? And he goes, listen, my boy here, some of his friends got jumped by some Crips with that tattooed on. You can argue it all you want. We can pull your covers, right? And I'm like, damn, bro, I'm fucked here, right? I'm like, I'm getting killed sitting in here on a year violation. And, uh, right. But they're like, well, we got some shit that needs to be taken care of, right? If you go handle this, he was the he was the key holder, which is the shot caller for my town, right? Like, there's a whole political system. Like, each town has a key holder. That's you know, we call it a car. They drive the car, and then there's the 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 key holder for the woods, right? And then you know, with just the whites in general, you got Nazi lowriders over here, you got skinheads over here, and they all got key holders and all that. But he was a key holder for the San Jose car and. And basically, he's like, listen, dude, I'm the key holder. You can go do this dirt for us. Or, uh, you know, we just put it out to the woods. You know, you're a crip on the street. And uh, it, honestly, it, it sometimes doesn't really matter what people say. Um, and, and we see this in the world today. People want to believe it. People want something shitty to believe about people, right? Um, and so... Yeah, I went and did this shit, man, and, and uh, nothing happened. Nothing, you know, they let it ride, they let it roll. And, and it was funny because it was beat up a child molester, which is already what I, I do. But, but I, I'm, well, so when they came up to me, man, and my head was like, come on, man, like, I've already done my dirt. I'm, I'm on a year, you know, I'm just doing a violation, right? I'm not trying to catch years on this. Uh, there's a whole thing how I got away with that when I went to court, man. I got away with the cops when I came back. I made some arguing about statute of limitations, knowing that the statute of limitations in prison goes away if you go out to court or whatever. And the captain knew that. He said this little intricacy that let me know he knew that, but they let me slide. The cops, man, they, they don't care that you beat up the child molesters. They put them on another main line yard and let it happen again. And then they let it happen again until they run out of yards and then they put them in protective custody. They like him, you know. And listen, I don't know about anywhere else, man. California State Prison, the inmates run the prison. We know what's going on. The captain's secretary is an inmate, right? You roll in, we already know what you're there for. And you hit the yard and you're, you're not going to show paperwork what you're there for. We already know. We already know what you're there for, bro. Um, yeah, so I got away with that. Um, and that was a time where I almost, I did, I, I to this day, am surprised that those dudes let me ride. Um, they must have really not wanted to do that dirt, right? Because white crips are hated in jail, man. They are hated. And then, yeah, um, before that, my buddy Orlando O'Dog, he had showed up and, and uh, he was like my best friend on the streets. And, and if he had been any, any less, a shave less, right? Like, like my number three or four friend, um, he probably would have said something. You know, either to the crew when I get out, this dude ain't banging us. Or, or to the people in there, this dude's a crip on the streets, you know? And there's a certain uh, responsibility to do that. He really should have, um, but he didn't. And uh, yeah, man, and, and, and then I changed my life. <laughs> 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 well, so I got, off, um, I got off parole in 04. And uh, my drinking was pretty bad now, man. And um, I was just kind of like an isolated dude. Like I wasn't a really around the homies anymore. And I, I kind of could do what I wanted because I'd already done time for these guys. And uh, I'd already put in work and, and you know, I'm in my late twenties. Um, and I'm, I'm just a worthless drunk, honestly, worthless drunk and, and, and lots of drugs, lots of meth, crystal meth. And um, I, I liked the hallucinogenics, but after a time, I didn't have time for all that. Right. It was just about like, <clears throat> I never liked who I was, man. You know, I never was okay with who I was and, and, and drugs and alcohol fixed that drugs and alcohol. They just fixed it, man. You know, 
a fog rolled in and, and I felt like life was worth living when I never felt that way as a kid. And I don't know why I had good parents, man. I had great parents, you know, uh, my mom and dad are amazing people. And my mom grew up with the odds stacked against her. Grandma's a heroin addict, you know, um, my sperm donor. And that's what I call him. I, I have like three half brothers, apparently. Uh, he went and got all these women who don't believe in abortions pregnant. And I got all these, who knows how many more half brothers I have, but he died of, of stuff that looks like drug and alcohol, um, liver failure, kidney failure, stuff like that. Uh, my mom drug herself out of that and made a life for us. And she met this man who I call my father. He came into my life around two or three. And so I can't blame like the streets, man, you know, uh, I sought it out. I was that guy who lived in the suburbs, man, who, who went to the hood, you know, and you could think what you wanted that, bro. I, I, they had what I needed, man. And, and, and what I needed later on in life was power. What I needed later on in life. I mean, Pat Tillman was a turning point in my life, man. I, there was nothing I could do about this. There was nothing I could do about these guys. I'm not bowing down. And I could only take so many ass whoopings. And then you crack me in the head with the football helmet after whooping my ass with all your friends over and over. Then you hit me with a football helmet? Enough, dude. Enough. And I'm showing up with 50 Crips and we're fucking destroying you all. You know, and, and, and it, it was just, you know, what else you got? <laughs> well, we're almost at the hour right now, Mike. You've told yeah. the story very well. Really appreciate it. I imagine you've got a lot more stories, your time in San Quentin and all this other stuff. But what, what we might do is... Um, <laughs> We'll put this one up and see how it goes. Maybe do a part two. You know, people are going to put comments and questions for you. We could go with that. Yeah. And, you know, and I'd also like, so Adrian Clark is how we, we, we were introduced. Um, you know, he's a mentor to me. And, um, you know, I'm part of a, 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 a community um, seeking spirituality, seeking, you know, recovery from drug and alcohol addiction and all kinds of, not other addictions, but uh, spiritual illness. And uh, so I don't want to just leave it like I'm still that guy. I, I was a terrible, terrible person. I did terrible, terrible things. Um, I didn't want to hurt people, but there were times where I did. I just didn't care. Um, but it was all self-hate, man. And, and again, I, I do want to say my life today is absolutely dedicated to helping people. You know, we're dealing with this, this uh, stuff we're dealing with in the world, this, this sickness going around. And I'm still out there on the front line with drug and alcohol addiction. And a lot of people are pissed off for me about it. And I don't really give a shit. It's what I do, man. My life is dedicated to helping people find a way out from what I found my way out from, you know, and, and um, yeah, so I, I, I do want to say that piece, man, that I'm really seeking to live a spiritual life. And, and I've, I've made right all the wrongs that I could. And, and uh, I'm trying to raise kids who, who, who know that the most important thing you can do is help people. It is the most important thing, man. I found the meaning of life in helping people. I was a taker for so long. So anyways, I, I don't want to go on and on and on. I just, I didn't want to end it on, you know, I'm just some terrible dude who should be locked up for life. So if people, um, if people watching this want to contact you, is there a way to do that? Or are you laying low? Yeah, no, I'm on Facebook, Mikey Hats. I have two Facebooks, but I'm known out here as Mikey Hats. If you look behind me, I got, that's, that's about five percent of my collection <laughs> yeah you can look at look me up on facebook mikey hats man and uh you know if larry or whatever wants to look me up dude you know whatever send that's me, really why send me, send me your facebook links and i'll put them in the description box below this video so people can click right over yeah and then i have my family's facebook link the one that my kids teachers look at and i'll never share that <laughs> <laughs> um but the mikey hats was i got i, I just got yeah i needed that one for for this kind of stuff and, and yeah so cool well sean thanks for having me man and yeah. uh thanks for your time mate it's been really fascinating you, you tell your story uh, really well <laughs> yeah i just have a gift for words man it was really i was really good at getting what i wanted with that but so. <laughs> all right cool, you man. Thank you. take care over there brother cheers thank all you right. thank you bye